Peter Pan loses the lost boys. A free audio book. Narrated by Mark Anthony Rains. Chapter 1. Children may grow up. It's just what children do. They stretch up the walls of the sky like huge tall trees reaching for the sun. Their arms sprouting this way and that. And when they become grown-ups, they don't stop there. No way. They just keep growing. Some grow long, grizzly beards. Some grow wibbly, wobbly, floppy ears. Some grow big, squashy noses. Some grow so much that their heads pop out of the top of their hair. But shh, keep quiet about that. You must never, never mention that to an older gentleman. They can be a bit sensitive about it. Trust me. Well, there is one person who is forever young, a boy who needs... Who never needs to worry about his hair or ears or nose or beard. A boy who will always be a boy. I think you might have guessed who I'm talking about, haven't you? There isn't a man, woman or mouse in the world who doesn't know the name of the mighty Peter Pan. Even just saying his name written down paints wonderful pictures in your head. Can you imagine him flying through the air, looping the loop and taking on the truly terrifying Captain Hook? Hook and his country crew. Oh, you mustn't forget the lost boys, his band of brothers supporting him on all the way. But what happens to Pete when Peter's friends aren't around? If they're off having adventures of their own, what does poor Peter do then? We all readers, that is what you will discover as this tale unfolds. That and much, much more besides. Chapter 2 Second to the right and straight up till morning. That's how you get to the home of Peter Pan. Simply second to the right and straight on till morning. Sounds as easy as it can be, doesn't it? And the way and in a way it is, because all of us at some point in our lives will be drawn to this place. The directions somehow already planted in our brains, each of us knowing exactly the way to go, without ever without ever really truly knowing how. We know when we will dip and dive over huge crushing. We know that we will dip and dive over huge crushing waves. We know that we will drift through huge blowing clouds as thunder begins to build. We even know that at halfway there, we will wish to turn back our pajamas soaked through with rain, but still we will fly, we will fly on heading to that wondrous place called Neverland. Most of us stay just for one night. We'll stay awake back in our beds as the sun rises. Knowing that we've been, we've been on a magical venture, our thoughts foggy. We'll try and try with all our might to remember what ha- has happened and where we've been. But according to what has occurred, we'll be like trying to spot a panther in the night. Almost impossible. we we'll slip away before you can see it and the memory will fade and disappear. Peter, however, lives in Neverland. It's a place he calls home. There isn't a day that goes by without him being there. So let's follow these million golden arrows. Let's fo- so let's fo- follow those million golden arrows, make our way past the turtles burying their eggs in the sand, and see what the mischievous fellow is up to. Chapter 3, The Hollowed Out Tree Were Quiet The Hollowed Out Trees Were Quiet and Still. Once upon a time, Peter then echoed with excitement and singing the loud songs. And there lay almost untouched, the light seemingly less bright, the fire not quite as warm as it used to be. Peter missed his friends dearly. And while he hoped they really were having great adventures, he couldn't wait to see them once again. One of the hollowed out trees was making this very strange high pitched noise. Could it be the chill wind blowing through its nooks and crannies? Unfortunately not. A close inspection, it seemed to be a gentle sob of a boy. Yes, it was out any yes, it was out any doubt. Crying of the most honest kind. Oh it could only Oh, that could only be be only one person. Oh normally sprightly hero, Peter Pan. What a truly sad thing. Peter Pan emerged from his resting place and dried his eyes with a crisp leaf. It's truth be told, he just pushed the tears around his face. 
as these are particularly good at absorbing moisture and make your face a bit dirty. The sad boy took a deep breath, looked around his once vibrant den and sighed a quite forlorn sigh. Oh, does it not give you a strange feeling in the pit of your stomach to see Peter Pan in such a situation? Boy was well known for having sparkle, was as flat as a hedgehog's pancake. Looking down, Peter saw a discarded bow and arrow, prized possession on the long since departed to- Toodles. Oh, Toodles, why did you have to leave? It's not fair. Peter angry cast a bow and f- arrow in the, to the fire. Immediately regretted it. Another tear escaped his eye, rolled down his cheek, and it was extinguished in the flames. Peter tried to stand a little taller, have courage, and, f- and think in a grown-up way, the way that Mr. Darling would. He tried to think about his feelings and why he felt the way he did. Why do I have this, this strange feeling dragging me down? Why do I feel so heavy when I fly? It's like that Darcy hook had tied an anchor around my waist. My lightness of joy has gone. Oh, how you missed the Lord's boys. How you missed the darlings. Wendy, my dear. How I would love to see you smile. Your smile and hear your laughter. <clears throat> but he was unsure when the Lost Boys would return. The darlings had all grown up. Left their land and made lives of themselves back in the big smoky city of London while he was still here, all alone without a friend in the world. Well, that's what he thought. But at the very moment a flash of golden light darted in the branches of the treetops, a bright yellow trail accompanied by a familiar sound, a sound that made Peter's heart flutter. Peter sat up with a start on the weight of his head and neck cut set, cast aside for the briefest of moments. Could it? Could it? possibly be is that you the little light of my life is that you Tinkerbell chapter 4 Peter was right of course it was his beloved friend the kindest of all fairies a little ray of sunshine grown in a skeleton leaf it could be no one else other than Tinkerbell but what Peter did not know was that Tink had been watching him quietly for a short time. She saw how much her friend's chest ate. She saw the enormous weight he was carrying on his shoulders. He wasn't actually carrying a real weight around. You must understand. Peter didn't have a bag of potatoes on one shoulder and a bicycle balance on the other. That would have been some trick. It's just that Tinkerbell understood how sad her chum felt and how much he missed his friends. Peter stood and turned around just in time to see a golden blaze of fairy dust paint its way through the air towards him. Tinkerbell, he shrieked with delight. My fairy friend, where have you been? I have missed you so. Peter grabbed Tinkerbell and showered over a thousand kisses, even though he, he absolutely and utterly hated kisses with every inch of his being. That's how happy he was to see the long lost fairy. It was then that Tinkerbell gathered herself, sat on his shoulder, and began to tell him all about her travels. You and I, good reader, would have heard nothing but a gentle chime of delicate bell, but Peter understood fairy very well and listened intently. Tink explained that she, she had travelled to the land of the fairies, the place where she was born, a home where all the fairies must return some day. There she learned more about fairy magic, but also about something even more powerful, play. Peter scoffed, play? How can that possibly be more powerful than magic, Tink? I think all the flying may have left you a little light-headed. But these harsh words from Peter did not sadden Tinkerbell. She knew he was confused and angry, and he found it hard to talk about his feelings. Instead, they bubbled up. He missed his friends, he missed the fun times these days, filled with endless laughter, poor, poor Peter. A thought started to build in Pinker's Bell's mind. What Peter needed was some new friends. Neverland was full of wonderful creatures. Peter was just needed to open his eyes and get a little bit of fairy positive positivity. Chapter 5 The Mermaids The Mermaids? 
Why on earth would I want to be friends with them? Peter was outraged. He stomped on angry from tree to tree, kicking each one for good measure, a ranting, raving as he went. What on earth is this fairy talking about? The memories? Why, I don't like them, and they certainly do not like me. Of that I can be quite sure. Does she not remember what happened last time we visited Mermaid Lagoon? Lug- Lug- well, the mermaid swam away. Tinkerbell disappears for what seems like an eternity, and comes back and tells him to make friends with the mermaids. That is one of, if not the most preposterous things I've ever heard. Utter, utter rot. That's what I say. Tinkerbell sat calmly in the branch of the willow and let Peter shout and holler for what seemed like hours. To be truthful, it was hours. Peter can get very angry at times. Finally, he slumped down at the base of the tree, completely utterly exhausted. He stared in the distance, feeling rather sorry for himself. Tink gently drifted down, landed on Peter's shoulder, and began to softly stroke his hair. Peter Smith wiped his hand across his red, puffy eyes, and then a barely audible voice whispered into his chest, I'm sorry, Tinkerbell. I am truly am. It just... I." It's just Peter struggled to find the words. The boy was usually so full of bravado, slumped his head and let Tinker gently smooth him. I understand, my dearest Peter. I may seem scary and daunting. Scary? Ha! Not for me, never. But if we use the power of play, I think something amazing could happen. What do you say? Peter screwed up his face incredibly tight. Imagine someone sucking up on the slowest level ever... Ever, you're getting close to the look. Play? What a silly suggestion. I won't, and I shan't do it, Tinkerbell. I don't play. I have real ventures. I was doing just fine before you came back. Thank you very much. With that, Peter stood up, stumped out the hollow, leaving Tinkerbell floating in midair. But she wasn't angry with her friend as she watched him angrily flee. She knew the sadness he was feeling deep inside. Chapter 6. It was a quiet in the hollow when Peter returned many hours later. He tiptoed in, surveying the scene quietly behind a large oak tree. What he saw was a wild blur of furry rings, magic dust and silver thread. Tinkerbell was busy himself with all kinds of material, dashing nimbly through the air. Of course, Tink knew that Peter was watching. Her fairy powers alerted her to his presence as soon as he had come back to the hollow. But she continued to work away, waiting to see if Peter would join her by playing. Finally, Peter inched forward, gingerly, one step at a time. Curiosity had got the better of him. He casually asked Tinkerbell, as if nothing had happened between them, what she was doing. So that, what's all this commotion about? When my fair, then, about, about then, my fairy, fair, fairy friend? Oh, he's just, well, he, oh, you didn't want to know anything about all this. But I do, I do, Peter insisted. That is most charming. Tinkerbell smiled. She turned around to face Peter. Well, Peter, what I have here are some puppets I've been making with the help of a good old needle, Fred. There's some fairy dust, of course. This one is you. Tink thrust the sock puppet toward Peter. And though a little rough around the edges, it was unmistakably our hero from Neverland. Of course, Peter had a few things to say about how he looked when he studied his small version of himself. Modesty was never his strong point. Well, the muscles aren't quite as big as they should be. My nose isn't as crooked. But yes, Tinkerbell, you've done a half-decent job, I must say. Why, thank you, Peter. And why, and, and what's that in your other hand, he asked inquisitively. Oh, these, these are the mermaids, of course, Peter. Uh, to, Think about how a, a gaggle puppets with long wavy hair and fishy tails. I am my loose I am my loathsome friend, going to share with you the truly wondrous power of play. Chapter seven Peter sat quietly as Tinkerbell began to explain what they'd been what they were going to do and how they would play together. Peter was going to use his puppet as though it was actually him. You know, really, he would really need to use his imagination to do that. They would pretend he was introducing himself to the mermaids, then get to know them by asking them questions, telling them all about himself, and talking through his likes and interests. 
Gah, that's, a, that's so stupid. They're only puppets. How are you going to help? How are they going to help me make friends in the real world? Peter scoffed. But Tinkerbell knew that play would most certainly help Peter. She knew play could could unlock secret new ways of talking and behaving. What play? The play could turn to be mice into mighty lions with majestic roars. Tinkerbell knew that play would help Peter figure out why he was feeling what he didn't understand. But Lost Boy's going. Trust me, Peter. Just give it a try. It may seem strange, but surely it's better to try it with me now than be scared when you go to the marine uh, mermaid's lagoon. Peter thought about this quietly for a short time, was shrugging, nodding his head and puffing out his cheeks. Well, okay, I suppose. You say that these sock puppets are, have some kind of magic? Then they must do. I'll play. If only to make you happy, dear Tinkerbell. Though it felt a bit difficult and strange at first, we began to put his uncertainty on one side. And do you know what? He actually began to have fun. Actual proper fun. The kind which he hadn't had since the Lost Boys had left. A pair played a wonderful game called Kind Words, which each puppet took its turn to say something positive about the other. Help Peter grasp feelings buried deep inside and find words were normally too tricky to say out loud. Peter discovered something else while he was playing Tinkerbell. He realised that mermaids might be just as nervous about meeting new people as he was. Ha! Huh. It might have something in common after all. After the pair had finished playing with the puppets, he found his confidence was returning, which made him realise he didn't need to be so scared. In fact, the little part of Peter began to look forward to meeting the mermaids. Who would have thought such a thing? Only a day earlier. Why, no one, of course. Peter stood up, clenched his fist and puffed out his chest. I'm going to do it, Tinkerbell. I'm going to go and make friends with real mermaids tomorrow, or you'll see. With that, Peter took himself off to bed and slept the stony sleep he had for many a month. Tinkerbell yawned, curled up to one of the fluffy mermaid puppets, and smiled. She knew that the real test lay ahead. Would play be powerful enough to make Peter's encounter with the mermaids a quite happy one? Well, she supposed she'll find that out the very next day. Chapter 8 The sun was shining on Neverland the next morning and Peter had just finished eating hearty breakfast, all imaginary, of course. You have to imagine your food in Neverland, as everyone does. Oh, Tinkerbell, I'm full and don't think I can move a single muscle. I'm just going to have to sit here all day and let my bacon and eggs go down. <laughs> Tinkerbell, of course, being the smart fairy that she was. So I'm waiting for Peter's excuses. Now, come on, Peter. I know you still might be a little ner- Peter, uh, nervous. Of course not. Well, let's go over to Mermaid's Lagoon right now, shall we? With that, he stood up and flew swiftly out of the hollow. Tinkerbell glided in beside him and held his hand. She thought this might help him feel more brave than it did. Without turning his head, Peter whispered oh, ever so softly, Thank you, Tink. Thank you. She gave his, his gentle, she gave his gently shaking hand a tight squeeze and landed quietly the fringes of mermaids of the lagoon where the dense tropical jungle met the crisp and white sands looked out for, and looked out for Peter's potential friends. Look, Peter. There they are, lounging by the rock poles. Peter peered over and counted them. Yes, one, two, three, more. Seven mermaids. Hmm, that was more than he had expected. They were stunning, they were st- stunning their tails and the warm rocks. Every so often they would dive into the cooling waters, for elegantly leaping back out and retaking their places on the dark volcanic zone. But now and ever, Peter stood up, dusted down his clothes, made himself presentable, and looked across the bench, beach, across the beach to see, across the beach to where the mermaids lay. Tink gave him some final words of encouragement. You do this, Peter. Just remember all the things we learnt about. We learnt. Just remember all the things we learnt when we played yesterday. And be yourself. Peter smiled at Tinkerbell and nodded to himself. Peter smiled at Tinkerbell and nodded to himself, then slowly and steadily walked across the hot sand towards the mermaids. They saw his approach and slowly sat up 
and sure what was at foot. Peter stopped a few meters away from the rocks and began to talk. If only Tinkerbell could hear what he was saying, he was just out of earshot, but perhaps Tink thought to herself, that was for the best. She wanted Peter to do this on his own. She knew that going by the power of play, he could do it. It was then that one of the mermaids slowly raised her hands above her head. Oh my, that what was happening? Chapter 9, the slow rhythmic sound stole across the bay. The mermaids were clapping, singing and dancing. Peter was like a boy transformed. The deep sadness Tink had seen only yesterday was washed, washed away. His smile on his face was as bright as the stars and twice as wide as the sun. He dipped his way in that through the air, twirling and whirling. In time, the, the music, his, as his new friends, the mermaids, clapped their hands, played their coach shells, and sang the most beautiful songs you can imagine. Tink have all been watching for what seemed to look like hours. The dancing singing had been almost unstopped. The music, my goodness, Tinkerbell, had never heard such wondrous sounds. They seemed to take over your body and mind, compelling your limbs to move in such amazing ways. If you're wondering how this all started, let me explain. Peter carefully walked down to the naturally suspicious Noah maids. They were unsure of his intentions, but Peter wasn't fearful. Well, perhaps just a little. But remember all the things he learnt about when playing with Tinkerbell. Well, my goodness, they worked. He introduced himself, told the mermaids about his likes and dislikes, asked them questions about themselves. As only, but surely they began to welcome, began to welcome Peter. It was there, then that the leader of the mermaids had raised hands above her head, going to clap out that wonderful, joyful rhythm that he had kept them all dancing into the evening. Friendship had been waiting all this time. It was just a stone's throw away for Pete's own. All he needed to do was uncover it. it was a little bay, a bit of confidence and the power of play, play. And some support from Tinkerbell, too, of course. As the sun began to set, the music began to slower, gentler, and more soothing as it was getting close to bedtime. Tinkerbell made her way over to Peter, who by his time was exhausted, exhausted but happy. He laid on his shoulder and they quietly whispered in his ear. Peter nodded, yawned, and turned into the mermaids. My fun and joyful friends, I have had the most wonderful day. I could keep partying until the night, but Sally and I must return home and keep the dance going in my dreams. Thank you so much. I should like to return soon, if I may. The leader of the mermaids put down their coach shell and smiled. Peekaboo heard her speak for the very first time. Her voice is soothing and kind. Thank you, Peter. You have shown us friendship is easy to uncover when you know how. We'd be delighted if you visited again. Here, take this. It will shine whenever we return to Marine Mermaid Lagoon. That she handed Peter a piece of coal, a shimmer with all the colours of the rainbow and many more besides. Peter thanked her and, they, and said goodbye before leaping into the air, sitting off for home. A Tinkerbell and Peter travelled through the poor night air. He didn't speak, and he both knew it had been a special. It had been a special day. Chapter ten. Peter lay down drowsily on his bed, and Tinkerbell pulled his coat up over his shoulders to his chin. Through the happiness of yawns, Peter said, Thank you, Tink. Thank you for everything. You have nothing to thank me for, Peter. You did it. You harnessed the power of play. You made those real friends, not me. You deserve to have the one wonderful dream tonight. Peter's eyes were closing, but then a gust of wind suddenly blew through the hollow. And at the very moment, who would sweep in but the lost boys? They are back from all the adventures. Peter, Peter left out his bed full of energy once again. He braced his friends one by one and proudly showed them his special place. Peter called the symbol of everything he achieved that day. He grabbed a little puppet version of himself again, acting all the things he learnt from Tinkerbell, inviting them to join him, join in and play. Soon they were racing round to hollow, puppets in hand, embracing adventures old and new. Peter was so proud of himself, but not in a big headed way. That day, that day had taught him that everyone had a power to make new friends. 
that even a little bit of help could go a very long way. So the next time the Lost Boys went off adventures, he would be just fine. In fact, he was going to induce the Lost Boys to mermaids the very next day. There were no two ways about it. What a lonely gang they would be, the Lost Mermaids. Think about a drifted way for the rapturous ro- ro- croup. I lay down on the leaf asleep, asleep, watched over her. She knew that Peter would be fine the next time she felt for the, she left for the land of fairies. He had made new friends all by himself. His confidence, which had taken out a knock, could continue to grow. She knew Peter would, could go to explore many sunny places, have amazing adventures, and make more wonderful friends. Fairies are right. Ray is the most powerful. It has helped this boy who had been a child for so long. Perhaps he was taking a little step. He was growing up. How incredible. Tinkerbell smiled happily to herself and slowly drifted off to sleep. The end. A bit for those who have grown up. So, we're glad you've, that things have worked out for Peter Pan in the end. It's thanks to the credible power play. Play isn't a strange, mythical, strange, mystical, Neverland magic. It's a real tangible benefits that can help children through some tricky situations. That's why Green, Great Oz, Oz, or Ormond Street Hospital has a whole team dedicated to play. Take Peter Pan, he was lonely, confused, and upset. Acting out his fears with Tinkerbell helped build his confidence, allowed him to make new friends. That's now that's truly amazing. To find out more, take a trip across to Gross Charities Brilliant Hub of Ideas, Activities and Resources at Gosh dot org dash play or search for Gosh G O S H Power or Play. You've been listening to Peter Pan Loses the Lost Boys. Peter Pan's merry band of friends, the Lost Boys, have gone off adventuring, left him in his own. He feels down, alone, and confident that he will make new friends. Can we turn to Tinkerbell, help her down to her companion, the amazing new discovery, the power play? And you just heard that he did. So, thank you for listening. Bye-bye now.